Have you ever like stumbled across something so unexpected, so out of the blue, that it feels like you've opened a door to another time? Hmm. It's kind of how I felt when I first heard about this lost Bram Stoker story. Oh. Yeah. A story by the author of Dracula, hidden away for over a century. Wow. And get this, it might even hold the key to understanding his most famous work. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of literary discovery that honestly sends shivers down my spine. It really is a remarkable find. Right. And, and what makes it even more intriguing is how it, it kind of challenges our preconceived notions about Stoker's, you know, creative process. Yeah, yeah. It's like finding a composer's early drafts of a symphony, right? Exactly. You get this glimpse into the evolution of their masterpiece. Precisely. In this case, um, we're talking about a story tucked away in the National Library of Ireland. Oh, wow. Just lying dormant until Brian Cleary, on a break from his work, get this, at a hospital stumbled upon it. Wait, hold on. A hospital worker uncovering a lost piece of literary history? Yeah. That's not your everyday occurrence. Right. It it sounds like something out of a novel itself. Yeah, it, it does. So what so what exactly did did Cleary find? So it all started with a rather unassuming discovery, right? A New Year's Day newspaper supplement from 1891. Okay. Now this supplement listed a story called Gibbet Hill among its featured works. Mm -hmm. But Gibbet Hill wasn't a title familiar to to Stoker scholars, you see. Oh, interesting. So so naturally, Cleary's curiosity was piqued. I bet. It's like finding a treasure map. You just have to follow where it leads. That's exactly what he did. He tracked down the full text of Gibbet Hill oh. and realized he had something truly, truly special on his hands. A, a missing piece of the Stoker puzzle. I am on the edge of my seat right now. So what what's the story about? Paint us a picture of this gothic world. All right. Imagine this. A nameless narrator finds himself on this this windswept hilltop in Surrey. Okay. He encounters three children near a, a rather eerie landmark, the, the memorial of a murdered sailor. The atmosphere is thick with a sense of foreboding, you know, setting the stage for, for the unsettling events to come. Okay, I'm already getting goosebumps. <laughs> we are talking about the mastermind behind Dracula after all. Right. So, so what happens next? So as the group led by these enigmatic children, ascends the hill, mm -hmm. and this is where the title comes in, they approach the, the ominous gibbet hill, named after the structures once used for public executions. Oh, wow. The, the narrator becomes separated from the children, mm -hmm. and when he finds them again, they're, they're no longer alone. They're accompanied by a snake, which they seem to be you know, commanding. Oh, okay. That escalated quickly. Right. Snakes and, and gothic literature just seem to go hand in hand, don't they? They do. What I... what kind of snake are we talking about here? Well, the exact species isn't specified, but it's it's described in a way that leaves no doubt about its sinister nature. Okay. The imagery Stoker uses is quite unsettling, emphasizing the, the creature's cold reptilian gaze mm -hmm. and its association with, you know, darkness, evil. It sounds like classic Stoker. Yeah. Using vivid imagery <laughs> to tap into our primal fears. Jeez. Is this where we start to see those early echoes of Dracula? Absolutely. Yeah. Remember that scene in Dracula where the Count crawls down the castle wall like a monstrous insect? Oh, yeah. Well, in Gibbet Hill, there's a similarly unsettling scene. Uh-huh. The story culminates in this chilling encounter where the snake attacks, mm -hmm. leaving this this bite mark on the narrator's chest. But... But here's where it gets really interesting. The story ends with the snake literally emerging from the narrator's chest Why? as if it had burrowed its way in and out before slithering away into the darkness. Wow, that's that's not just creepy, that's downright disturbing. The, the symbolism is hard to miss. Yeah. The snake is this parasitic force violating and then vanishing, yeah. leaving this, this lingering sense of unease. It definitely resonates with the themes of invasion and corruption we see in Dracula, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does. And and this is precisely why Cleary felt he had stumbled upon something significant. Mm. To confirm his suspicions, he reached out to Paul Murray, a, a leading Bram Stoker scholar. Oh, wow. It wasn't just a casual fan, you know, making connections. It was a, a scholar who could verify the authenticity and potential importance of this find. So we're not just dealing with a spooky story. We're talking about a potential missing link in understanding Stoker's creative evolution. Exactly. And Murray's analysis confirmed those suspicions. Okay. He pointed out how specific themes and imagery in Gibbet Hill seemed to foreshadow elements that would later become, you know, iconic in Dracula. Like those eerie children, for example. 
I can't help but think of Dracula's vampire brides. You're spot on. The three children, with their strange allure, their their air of menace, seem to be a clear precursor to those those iconic figures. Right. And the similarities don't end there. Okay. Both stories feature this recurring motif of eyes gleaming with an unholy light, a detail that Stoker would use to chilling effect in Dracula. Yeah. It's as if he's testing out these gothic elements, mm -hmm. refining his craft before unleashing them on the world in their full, terrifying glory. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's as if we're catching this this glimpse of Stoker's imagination at work, mm -hmm. you know, piecing together the the elements that would later become his signature style. Yeah, yeah. And what's what's even more compelling, I think, is that the connections between Gibbet Hill and Dracula, they they go beyond just the supernatural. You're right. There's there's a whole other layer to unpack here. Right. A layer that speaks to like the anxieties of Victorian England. Exactly. Mm. Both stories in their own way kind of touch upon this idea of reverse colonization, right. a concept that, that deeply resonated with the fears and uncertainties of, of Stoker's time. It, it's easy to forget, living in the 21st century, that Victorian England, despite you know its imperial power, right. was grappling with these anxieties about its own vulnerability. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, so imagine being you know at the height of an empire, right? Mm -hmm. Yet harboring this, this underlying fear, this sense of unease that it, it could all come crumbling down wow that's the essence of reverse colonization uh -huh. that fear of the colonized the the other yeah. rising up and and overturning the established order and this fear wasn't just limited to like a loss of political power was it no 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 it was also about like cultural change right the anxieties of a society facing an influx of people and ideas from from its colonies Precisely. And and this is where Gibbet Hill and Dracula become particularly um, interesting. Okay. In Gibbet Hill, we see this anxiety kind of manifested in the two Indian children who accompany the narrator. Mm -hmm. Their presence on that English hilltop with its own dark history takes on this this symbolic weight. Yeah. They, they represent this foreign element, this this intrusion into the familiar. It's almost as if Stoker is like using these children as a way to explore those those very real societal fears. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's Dracula himself. Right, right. Dracula, the the quintessential outsider. He he embodies these anxieties on this on this grander scale. Right. He's not just a vampire. Right. He's a foreigner from Eastern Europe with his you know strange customs and and insatiable thirst, literally preying on on English society. Wow. He becomes the symbol of everything that Victorians feared about the unknown, about mm -hmm. the potential for, for outsiders to, to disrupt their way of life. So both stories in their own way are reflecting these very real anxieties of the time. Yes. The fear of invasion, both mm. both literal and metaphorical. Exactly. And and what makes Stoker such a, a master storyteller mm -hmm. is his ability to to weave those anxieties into his narratives so seamlessly. Yeah. You know, he's he's not hitting you over the head with with social commentary. He's he's inviting you into this world of suspense and horror, but yeah. but beneath the surface these these deeper themes are simmering. It's like he's tapping into the the collective unconscious of his Time. Yep. giving voice to those those unspoken fears and and that makes the discovery of gibbet hill all the more like significant it does it's not just a spooky story it's a window into the the fears and fascinations of a society yeah you know on the cusp of change mm -hmm. so so how can people experience this this rediscovered piece of literary history mm -hmm. has it been republished it has and in a in a rather fitting turn of events okay. the rotunda foundation which get this has ties to the very hospital where cleary works is publishing it oh wow talk about a full circle moment that's incredible it's it's as if the story itself has come full circle right from from being lost in the archives to being brought back to life by by someone connected to those very archives. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a wonderful testament to the the enduring power of literature mm -hmm. and the unexpected ways in which discoveries are made. It is. It is indeed. And to make this even more special, um, the publication is is accompanied by artwork. Oh. Cool. Adding this this visual dimension to this literary rediscovery. That's fantastic. So yeah. we have a new edition with with artwork, but but will there be other ways to experience Cubit Hill? Perhaps an exhibition or a public reading. You read my mind. There's going to be an exhibition at Casino Marino in Dublin wow. featuring the artwork of Paul McKinley. 
Okay. And for for those eager to hear Stoker's words brought to life, Gibbet Hill will be read publicly for the first time at the the upcoming Bram Stoker Festival. Wow, that's something special. To to hear those words, you know, yeah. penned over a century ago, echoing in a room full of of literature enthusiasts, it mm. it sends shivers down my spine just thinking about it. Yeah. It it really highlights how how literature can transcend time. Mm-hmm. It's it's not just about words on a page, but about the power of those words. To, to transport us, to make us think, and and to connect us across generations. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, a story like tucked away in the archives, seemingly lost to time, mm-hmm. suddenly brought back into the light. Right, offer not just you know entertainment, but also this glimpse into the fears and and preoccupations of a bygone era. It really makes you wonder what stories we're telling ourselves today, yeah, both yeah. consciously and, and unconsciously. Right. Just like, you know, those Victorians grappling with anxieties about uh, reverse colonization. Right. We have our own our own fears and fascinations right? yeah. and own uh, others that we that we project our anxieties onto. That's that's what I find so compelling about literature. Yeah. It, it acts as this this mirror mm-hmm. reflecting the anxieties of the time in which it was written. Yeah. But it also like transcends those times. Right. Offering insights into the the human condition that that remain relevant across generations. Exactly. And Gibbet Hill with its exploration of, you know, fear, otherness and the the darkness that lurks beneath the surface. Mm-hmm. It it speaks to those those universal themes. Mm-hmm. It's a reminder that some fears are are timeless. Yeah. That the that the monsters we create, both real and imagined, they they continue to haunt us. It it makes you think about the stories we consume today. Yeah. In books, movies, even the news. Mm-hmm. Like what fears are being reflected back at us? Yeah. What what anxiety is being exploited or or amplified? Right. And and how do those stories shape our our understanding of the world and our place in it? Those are those are questions worth pondering. Yeah. And and perhaps exploring Jivet Hill, this this rediscovered piece of of Stoker's imagination, can can serve as a starting point for that reflection. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a story that that invites us to delve into the shadows, mm-hmm. not just of, you know, Victorian England, yeah. but also of, of our own psyches, right? Yeah. It encourages us to to confront those those fears and anxieties that we might not even be fully aware of. And and in doing so, we might just discover something new about ourselves, about the the power of stories to yeah. to eliminate the the darkest corners of our minds, mm-hmm. and and about the the enduring legacy of a writer who, you know, over a century later, still has the ability to to send shivers down our spines. Well said. Yeah. It seems we've we've unearthed more than just a a lost story today. Yeah. We've uncovered this this pathway into the the enduring power of fear, mm-hmm. fascinations, and the the stories we tell ourselves about the the world around us. And sometimes it's it's those stories buried deep within the archives, right. waiting to be you know rediscovered. Yeah. that have the the most to teach us about ourselves. So if you're if you're looking for a, a chilling read mm-hmm. that will stay with you long after you've you've turned the final page, yeah. I, I encourage you to seek out Gibbet Hill. I agree. It's a story that offers this this glimpse into the mind of a master storyteller, mm-hmm. a window into the anxieties of a a bygone era, yeah. and perhaps even a, a mirror right. reflecting our own hidden fears. Mm-hmm.